Good afternoon. So, um, we will continue from uh, where we left and we expect to finish our discussion of electrostatics today. Uh, so, what we did just before we went for lunch is to try to look at uh, the Maxwell's equation. So, what uh, we said is uh, that uh, the Gauss's law was that the flux through any closed surface is given by the amount of charge which is enclosed inside divided by epsilon 0. And we used the divergence theorem to convert this into a um, differential form of the Gauss's law. So, since the flux is defined as the surface integral of the electric field E dot ds and this by divergence theorem is divergence of E the volume integral of the divergence of E and that is equal to 1 over epsilon 0 and the enclosed charge is nothing but the integral of the charge density rho uh, over the volume. So, if you now compare these two expressions what we get is since this is going to be valid for any volume we must have the integrands equated. So, divergence of E which is also written as del dot of E is equal to rho divided by epsilon 0. This is the first equation of uh, Maxwell that we are doing it in uh, differential form. So, let us proceed with it. Um, I d will not repeat this uh, slide because I prove to you that Gauss's law can be derived from Coulomb's law and I repeat because many of you have been pointing it out. The thing is you are all right that uh, Gauss's law though completely is equivalent to Coulomb's law. Uh, in order that we can use Gauss's law effectively the problem that we are doing must have sufficient amount of symmetry. And uh, Coulomb's law on the other hand is a basic law. Now, do not think that means Coulomb's law is any more effective than Gauss's law because uh, doing these vector sums using Coulomb's law is not always possible. So, the ultimately if a problem has symmetry it is easy, if a problem does not have a symmetry you will be using Coulomb's law, but whether you can uh, still effectively get a result or not depends on your ability of doing some complicated in, uh, integrations etcetera. So, I gave you this example of how where I do not have a symmetry obvious symmetry I can make it a symmetrical situation. Remember the surface or the volume that we have it does not have to be a real volume it could be an imaginary volume. In other words Gaussian surfaces could be imaginary. I will not repeat this problem which we did earlier and so let me let me instead uh, go over to a uh, different problem uh, to illustrate the power and in this case it is not just Gauss's law I am using it along with the principle of superposition that uh, um, so basically what I want to do is that I have a uniformly charged sphere with a cavity inside it. Now, I will go over to the uh, write up uh, here. So, let us uh, look at that. So, uh, uh, remember this is of course, school physics. So, I what I am doing is this that I have uh, let us say a uniformly distributed charge Q. Uh, so, if I have a uniformly distributed charge Q, uh, so I will define the charge density to be rho and so this is 4 pi by 3 r cube times rho. Now, uh, if I have a uniformly charge distributed charge then of course, so far as a point outside is concerned the field is given uh, by the Coulomb's law assuming as if the entire charge is located at its center. Now, on the other hand if I look at a uh, distance let us say which is r a smaller distance from uh, the full radius. So, I am looking at the electric field here. Now, the amount of charge enclosed is now within this 4 pi by 3 small r cube volume. And if you look at now first is symmetry. So, where does symmetry come from? Since this is spherical these all these points on the surface of a circle of radius small r are symmetric. So, therefore, my flux is simply electric field times 4 pi r square the direction of the electric field is obviously radial by symmetry. So, I am not writing down the vector sum. Now, this quantity is equal to q enclosed divided by epsilon 0. 
Now, now how much is q enclosed? Because this is a sphere of radius smaller, so it is equal to 4 pi by 3 r q small r cube times rho and of course divided by 1 over epsilon divided by epsilon 0. So, if you look at it my electric field at a distance small r less than for r less than r is given by uh, rho times r small r divided by 3 epsilon 0 and of course, the direction is a radial direction. Now, this is of course, you are familiar I am not writing the corresponding expression for r cap greater than uh, r this is obviously given by Coulomb's law for a point charge. Okay. Now, the point is the problem that I have here is the following that I look at a sphere of radius r and I assume that there is a cavity here. So, the center of the cavity is located from the center of the uh, sphere at a uh, position given by vector d. So, this is a sphere with a cavity. This is actually an excellent example of uh, the use of superposition principle. So, how do I handle this? So, the job is to find out the uh, electric field at a point uh, let us say p. Uh, this point is uh, inside the cavity located at the position small r. Now, in order to do this problem, the what I do is this. I imagine that my cavity is filled up. Now, how do I fill up a cavity? Remember cavity is nothing but emptiness. So, therefore, I assume that a cavity is replaced by a superposition of charge density rho and a charge density minus rho because rho minus rho is equal to 0. So, if you superpose a charge density rho with a charge density minus rho, then I have essentially a cavity with no charge at all. Now, by introducing this charge density rho, what I have done is fill up the big, big sphere. So, my problem has now a big sphere of radius r having a charge density rho because now everything is filled up having rho plus a small sphere okay, having a charge density minus rho. Now, notice one thing that when I have stated the problems in terms of rho the radius of the sphere is not coming into the picture. So, what I do is this I now write down I now write down what is the what is the field. So, let us redraw that picture again this time in a much bigger way. So, here is your cavity this is the center this is the vector d. and this is the point p and this is my r. So, what actually do I do? So, the field due to the bigger sphere the field due to the bigger sphere is obviously rho by 3 epsilon 0 times vector r. Now, the field due to the smaller sphere now notice the point p is at a vector distance r minus d from there. So, therefore, due to the smaller sphere is rho by, but this is rho is minus rho minus rho by 3 epsilon 0 and the position of that is r minus d.
So, this is the power of superposition principle. If you add it up, you notice that the field is simply given by rho by 3 epsilon 0 times d, vector d. Notice one thing, the vector d is a given distance between the center of the original sphere, the big sphere with the small sphere. In other words, vector d is a constant quantity. So, therefore, the field inside a cavity is constant. This is really a very interesting result. Continuing with my discussion, I uh, give you a third example and this is, let us talk about intersection of two spheres. Intersection intersection of two oppositely charged spheres, two oppositely charged spheres. So, there is no cavity in the problem, but I have two spheres. So, this is first sphere having a charge density rho. I have another sphere having a charge density minus rho the center of this is O and the center of this is O prime. Now, the idea is to find out the field in the, to find field in the, overlap region. Once again, it is an excellent example of or illustration of the principle of superposition. So, look at any point here, supposing this is the point P and this uh, vector is there, uh, you can call it anything. So, uh, and the, so due to the uh, first sphere, due to the first sphere, my field is given by, at the point P is given by rho by 3 epsilon 0 and O P vector. Due to the second sphere, it is also given by a similar expression, but because rho is oppositely directed, it is minus rho by 3 epsilon 0 O prime p, which gives me that this is rho by 3 epsilon 0 O p minus O prime p. But what is O p minus O prime p? This is nothing but the vector joining the two centers. So, which is nothing but rho by 3 epsilon 0 into O O prime. So, once again you notice this is an example in which the field is again constant, because the field in the interface region did not depend upon actually where your point P is. It did not depend upon where your point P is, but it depends only on the vector distance between the two uh, uh, centers of the circle. So, therefore, this is uh, an illustration of the, let us go over to the uh, screen. So, this uh, uh, and if you people have any specific problems or questions you want to be answered, you can just send it uh, uh, as a chat. We will, I will take care of it tomorrow, because as I said, we have spent a lot of time in the morning today. So, the, the next question that I want to take up is this, that having done so much about electrostatics, it is time now to summarize the electrostatic uh, situation. First thing to know about that is, we have pointed out several times that Coulomb force is central, uh, meaning thereby that the strength of the force depends only on the distance. As we know in this case, it is inverse square of the distance and it is along the line joining the source and the charge. So, therefore, it is a central force. Second thing is that it is a conservative force, like you have done gravitational force. Uh, a conservative force by definition means that I can define a scalar potential. So, let us do that, because my force expression, I have not written down the 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 etcetera. My four, uh, force expression is basically vector r by r cube. So, if you take the curl of this expression, you get the 
uh, curl of now this is a vector multiplied by a scalar 1 over r cube times vector r. Now when you have a vector multiplied by scalar the del cross of that is gradient of the scalar cross product with the vector plus the scalar times the curl or the uh, curl of that vector. So, you write that down. So, it is del that is gradient of 1 over r cube which is my scalar cross r plus 1 over r cube times del cross of r. Now, this is very trivial because it depends upon r only. So, it is like differentiating with respect to r. So, 1 over r cube differentiated as you know is minus 3 by r to the power uh, uh, 4 which since it is a vector I write it as minus 3 vector r by r to the power 5 cross r del cross of r you can trivially calculate and show it to be equal to 0 and this is r cross r which is equal to 0. So, therefore, del cross of f that is the field is equal to 0. Now, curl of any field being equal to 0 indicates that it is conservative. So, we have seen this in case of gravitational field it is true of electrostatic field also. Now, I need an expression for electrostatic potential. Uh, I am not going to do a lot of derivation, but there are few things which I must point out. So, you notice I am interested in finding out what is that quantity, what is that quantity whose gradient gives me 1 over r cube, uh, r vector r by r cube. Now, it by definition of gradient 1 over r minus r prime is minus r minus r prime by r minus r prime cube. So, therefore, my electric field, my electric field which by Coulomb's law is written like this because I have charge density and of course, this is my inverse square law and this gives me the distance. So, I use the fact the r minus r prime by r minus r prime cube is minus the gradient of this. So, I write this as this quantity there. Now, you remember the definition of a potential we said vector E is equal to minus grad phi. Okay, there is technically uh, a, an extra minus sign that has come in, but let me alert to you on one thing. It is not necessary that you define this. This is physics people always like to define their potential with a minus sign. That is we define electric field to be equal to minus the gradient of a potential, but mathematics people define the things as gradient of a potential, there is no controversy that both of them are right. They it depends upon a, a, a you know I mean a sign on your potential. So, therefore, I have made a mistake with respect to physics. So, this minus should go and I have phi of r given by this expression and this is the uh, potential. Morning uh, we had questions which I discussed our friends also talked online. The point is why a potential? Now, we have realized there are many, many advantages of using a potential rather than using an electric field. The first and the foremost is that a potential is a scalar quantity. Now, if a quantity is scalar, you know that when you are using superposition principle, you simply add them up a plus b plus c. You do not worry about what is the direction of that. Now, on the other hand, if you wanted to use the electric field, the electric field being a vector, use of superposition principle will get you into much bigger trouble. So, supposing I have many sources, I want to calculate how much is the electric field using the electric field expression due to each one of them and adding them up vectorially is a very tall order. So, what one does is to find out the potential add up the potential because they are numbers like thing I mean they are scalar functions add up the, add them up and finally, on the final thing just do a uh, del operation. So, where do we stand now? We have been talking so far only about electrostatic field and these two equations this one and that one both of them we derived that is divergence of the electric field is rho by epsilon 0, I have told you that there is a divergence 
whenever there is a source in this case the charge source. But electric field is conservative, static electric field is conservative. I want you to remember this uh, that electric field is conservative is an incorrect statement. Electrostatic field is conservative because we will see later when electric field arises due to time variation of the magnetic field, this statement will not be correct. But at this moment, we are only doing electrostatics. So therefore, these are the two Maxwell's equations that we deal with. Okay. Next question, what is this potential? I mean, is there any relationship between potential and potential energy? Remember, potential energy is something which we have always learned. So, let us try to understand there is a relationship, but do not be under the impression that potential is the same thing as potential energy. In fact, it is probably a very unfortunate nomenclature calling it by the one could have given it some other name, but we cannot change history. So, understand the following that supposing you have a charge Q at let us say infinite distance or anywhere where you decide that the uh, uh, reference point of the potential is 0. Normally for Coulomb forces we take the potential to be 0 at infinite distance, but we know that that is not really always necessary. We will give examples to show that it is not necessary. In fact, there are some problems where you should not be using the potential equal to 0 at infinity only. So, so wherever the potential is equal to 0, that is your reference point. Now, from that suppose there is a charge Q at that point and U, now U meaning not the Coulomb force, but U as an external agency, you bring that charge and put it at a point P. Now, remember the work that you do is negative of the work done by the force because you have to overcome that force. And how much work do you do? Yeah, the force is given by Q times, I suppose I have, I have not written a Q there, but it does not make any difference. Let us take a unit charge, move from reference point where the potential is 0 to the point R, E R dot dr. Now, this is very important here. Electric field being conservative, this uh, work that is done does not depend upon the path that you take. So, therefore, bring it by the shortest, simplest path that is the radial line joining your reference point to wherever you want to put it. Okay? You, uh, if it is not along the radial line, it does not make any difference. You go transverse, come to the radial line uh, in line with the point where you want to bring, but on the transverse line the work done is 0 because the electric field is radial whereas you are going transverse to it. So, therefore, ultimately you simply get this electric field is minus the gradient of the potential dq bar prime and this by fundamental theorem of algebra. Remember the way gradient is defined is nothing but d phi. So, which is gives me minus phi of r. So, the if this is true, this tells me the work done by an external agency in bringing a charge q to p is phi times q, uh, q phi times q. Now, this then is stored as the potential energy of the system. Now, the potential therefore, is nothing but the potential energy. Now, I am saying, I am not saying potential energy off, but I am saying the potential energy which is associated with the unit charge. Okay? So, the two words are used and one has to realize that there is a bit of a confusion sometimes, but potential has something to do with potential energy, but potential is not the potential energy. So, let me give you a couple of examples of how to calculate potential. I have chosen problems which are slightly different. So, let us look at suppose I have a line charge. The line charge is basically an infinite charge with a linear charge density. Now, remember one thing a line charge contains in infinite amount of charge, but by definition the line charge has a finite density. So, normally a line charge density will be represented by us with lambda. So, let us take uh, a cylinder 
around it having a radius r and let us say that the length of the cylinder is l. Now notice one thing that since the charge is the line charge is taken to be infinite then there is no edge effect when I do that that is because both the ends are equal distance from the ends if it is there. So the question is that I have now established a symmetry by Gauss's law because that then on the surface of this cylinder my direction of the electric field by symmetry has to be radial. So therefore my E dot ds which is the flux. So it is nothing but the electric field strength times the area which is of this cylinder and how much is the area of this cylinder 2 pi r l because 2 I have said length is l radius is the distance from the this thing is r so it is e times 2 pi r l which is uh, the uh, by Gauss's law e dot ds is nothing but the charge enclosed. How much is the charge enclosed? The length is l since lambda is the charge density lambda times l is the charge enclosed. So this quantity is lambda times l by epsilon 0 cancel out things and get that electric field magnitude is given by lambda by 2 epsilon 0 1 over r the direction has been missing but by symmetry the direction is outward. Now notice this I was not particularly interested but since uh, in calculating this but since this is an illustration of Gauss's law I let it go there. So the electric field uh, magnitude goes as 1 over r. Now if that is 1 over r what is my phi? Now my phi then is uh, remember that um, the uh, if I have to integrate electric field that is what is that function whose derivative gives me 1 over r very clearly logarithm of r. So it is phi I need a minus because my del minus del phi is electric field so therefore it is minus lambda by 2 epsilon 0 logarithm of r and like we have done an integration so therefore there is a constant of integration there. Now notice here this is the type of example I was telling you that in this case you cannot say that let us choose the reference point that is phi equal to 0 at infinity. You cannot do it because if you do that there is a divergence and logarithm of infinity that is not possible. You can say that phi is equal to 0 at 0 because logarithm of 0 also does not make sense. So you can choose the reference point wherever you want but a very convenient point to choose is to eliminate eliminate this constant. Now you then you do one thing you choose r is equal to 1 supposing you say at r is equal to 1 my phi is equal to uh, 0. Now you can see immediately that then this constant because log of 1 is 0 so I will get 0 is equal to 0 plus constant which means that constant is 0. So therefore the potential corresponding to line charge is minus lambda by 2 epsilon 0 times logarithm of r. So this uh, problem illustrates an important point that the reference point for a potential is something which one can choose the way we want it. Okay. The next thing that I want to do is to calculate or talk about the electrostatic potential of an electric dipole. But before that I need to define what is a dipole vector. This is, this is a point which a lot of students make a mistake. So it would be a good idea that when you are teaching it please point it out. See basically an, a, an electric dipole is nothing but two small charges q and minus q separated by a short distance. Okay. The magnitude of the electric dipole moment if you like is q times that dis distance. But by convention and it is very important to realize that the direction of the dipole moment vector is from negative, negative charge to the positive charge. This is the direction of the unit vector. So my dipole moment vector p is q d times unit vector p and what is a unit vector? This is a vector along the direction joining minus q to plus q. Okay, let me let me come back to my screen uh, my um, paper 
and uh, try to find out an expression for the potential uh, of in the situation that I have given you. So, my uh, picture is something like this that supposing this is my minus q and this is plus q though remember that my actual distances must be much smaller, but I am illustrating it. So, I am drawing a little bigger. Now, uh, I am interested in finding out what is the potential at an arbitrary point p. And suppose this point p from the positive charge is at a vector distance r plus and the from a negative charge it is at r minus capital R minus. Now, where is how do I define this point p? We take the center point of the uh, dipole and say that this vector this is the vector r that is I am interested in finding out what is the potential due to the dipole due to dipole at position vector r. Now, I need to remind you of a bit of uh, arithmetic or trigonometry if you like this angle is theta. So, you remember your triangle law. So, that triangle law told you that r plus this distance is given by um, okay, this uh, uh, this vector distance was d. So, therefore, this is d by 2 and this is also d by 2. So, this is equal to um, r square plus d by 2 whole square which is d square by 4 minus 2 times r times d by 2 times cos theta. And since it is r plus I need to put a thing on it. Okay. So, and this quantity then would be uh, notice that uh, the distance d square by 4 is a very small quantity. So, so what I do is this that I neglect this pull out a r there. So, I get 1 plus um, d by r cos theta raised to the power half and that then gives me r into 1 plus d by 2 r cos theta binomial expansion and correspondingly I have uh, an expression for r minus which will be very similar it will be r into 1 minus d by 2 r into cos theta. So, therefore, uh, if I want to write down the potential at p now remember uh, from here uh, from the positive charge it is at r plus from the negative charge it is at r minus. So, I get 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q by r plus minus q by r minus. So, plug these two in this is actually approximately equal to because I have done a binomial expansion. So, you put them back and uh, well uh, you notice that your r is there in both of them. So, they will cancel out because of the minus sign and you will be left with uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times uh, uh, well there is a uh, 1 over r there and I need that. So, therefore, I get um, q d cos theta divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 r square. And we have just now said that q times d that is your dipole moment. So, therefore, the expression for the potential becomes 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times uh, p dot there is a cos theta there. So, p dot unit vector r divided by r cube. 
So, this is this is the expression, this is the expression for your uh, the potential due to a dipole. Now, why am I talking about potential due to a dipole? And that I will be coming to in a short time. Now, notice that because the potential was 1 over r square type potential, uh, the remember Coulomb forces potential was 1 over r and this is 1 over r square. So, the corresponding electric field due to this uh, dipole is goes as 1 over r cube and that is what we have done there. Just do a uh, gradient of that potential you would get the uh, uh, this thing and, and you know this is the way one actually plots. You could go to a Mathematica or things like that and try to find out how the electric field varies. Here is a negative charge, here is a positive charge and you uh, feed in the expression for the electric field and you can get beautiful pictures which you must have seen uh, there. Having done that, let me now come back to uh, another important thing. It will be, I am afraid that the situation will be a little mathematical, but let us see what is the best we can do. Um, now, this is Poisson's and Laplace's equation I want. Remember, we talked about del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon 0. We also said that the electric field is negative gradient of the potential. So, therefore, del dot of del phi or rather minus del phi that is equal to rho by epsilon 0, which means del square phi is equal to minus rho by epsilon 0. This is an important equation. This equation is known as the Poisson's equation. Now, suppose I have a region of space where there is no uh, source, then my rho is equal to 0. So, in that region I satisfy del square phi is equal to 0. Why? What does it mean? The, this is the equation which we will be talking about today. This is called Laplace's equation and this is called Poisson's equation. In fact, most of the time you would be interested in finding out the potential in a source free space. That is the, the source could remain somewhere, but I am interested in finding out what is the potential at a point. Okay? in that region where there is no source. The field has been created by something. So, this is called Laplace's equation. This equation is an extremely interesting equation, both from mathematics point of view and from physics point of view. But before I do that, I want to talk about one small thing and that is what is known as electrostatic boundary condition. See, boundary conditions are things which are usually neglected in a class, but on the other hand they are extremely important. Take for example, a, uh, I have given you an example of a, an infinite seat of charge. Now, you have seen that if I have a charge density sigma, then the electric field above the sheet is oppositely directed to that below the sheet. Now, this has very interesting consequences, look at it. The question we are asking is, what is the difference between the electric field immediately above a charge uh, surface and a point immediately below a charge surface. Now, look at this from Gauss's law. So, we said that consider a Gaussian surface and the Gaussian surface is an imaginary surface which I have taken to be a rectangular parallel pipe. Rectangular parallel pipe of height epsilon half of is above the field above the surface half of is below the surface and this epsilon will be taken to go to 0. Now, and you can take some length L some width B does not matter. So, I know that E dot ds is q enclosed by epsilon 0 which is how much is q enclosed? The q enclosed is nothing but whatever is the area intercepted by this uh, uh, imaginary Gaussian surface, supposing that area is A. Then if charge density in sigma, the amount of charge that is enclosed in this Gaussian surface is sigma A by epsilon 0. But look at it now, that, but, but how do I calculate this? Notice one thing that as this epsilon go to 0, then the contribution to the electric uh, 
uh, flux from those which have share this height because that area goes to 0. So, therefore, the flux goes to 0. So, what I am left with are these two surfaces only the top surface and the bottom surface which we have already said the area is A. But then on the top surface my electric field is E perpendicular above it is normal uh, normally directed above. So, it is the surface integral will be E perpendicular above multiplied by A and the other one is E perpendicular below multiplied the, there is a double above written this should be below multiplied by A and there is a minus sign because we know that oppositely directed where the direction of the normal is opposite. So, E perpendicular above the normal component of the electric field above minus the normal component of the electric field below cancelling out A is sigma by epsilon 0. Now, I want you to understand this. This is telling me that if the I look at a charged surface, if I look at a charged surface then the normal component of the electric field has a discontinuity. The normal component of the electric field above minus electric field below is given by sigma by epsilon 0 the or in the other words sigma is epsilon 0 times this. Now, supposing this surface that I have given you were actually a conductor. Now, if it were a conductor then of course, inside the conductor the electric field is not there. Okay? Now, so therefore, E perpendicular below is 0 and we only, only have one of them. So, therefore, the I only have electric field above and this term is not there because inside the um, uh, conductor the electric field is 0 because a conductor uh, material of the conductor cannot tolerate an electric field. So, E perpendicular in case of a conductor is simply equal to sigma by epsilon 0. This is something which one uses at a later stage. The other problem is now, now that I have said that the number normal component of the electric field has a discontinuity provided I meet a charged surface. If there is a charged surface my normal component has a discontinuity. What about uh, a tangential component? Now, in order to find out the tangential component you do the following. You take a, a loop now this time not a surface, but a loop of height epsilon again and uh, run, run half of it is above and half of it is below and find out the uh, contour integral of the electric field around. Now, notice that the because my integral E dot d L I am uh, computing how much is the integral E dot d L because as my epsilon goes to 0 this nothing is enclosed inside this. So, this must be equal to 0 it tells me parallel component above is equal to the parallel component below. So, summarizing this it means the normal component of electric field has a discontinuity provided there is a charge surface. If it meets a surface there is a discontinuity. Tangential component of the electric field is however, continuous. Now, this is this is these two boundary conditions should be understood by people. Return back to Poisson's and Laplace's equation. So, we have said that I am going to be this is del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon 0 and uh, so, if I take uh, realize that E is minus del phi this gives me del square phi is minus rho by epsilon 0 and del square phi is 0 this is Laplace's equation. Now, in addition I know that electric field is a conservative field. So, therefore, it is an irrotational field del cross of E is equal to 0. So, these are my uh, workhorses. Now, I will uh, go through this section a little fast because a lot of you have pointed out to me that do not waste time on derivations these are there in the books, uh, but I need some information out of there. So, I will not that not derive taking time, but I will point out what the derivations are and then you can of course, look up the notes which will be put up. So, look at I am interested in solving Laplace's equation, Poisson's equation difficult I will not do that. Incidentally solutions of Laplace's equations are known as harmonic functions. So, let us look at 
Supposing I am in three dimension, the Cartesian uh, del square is simply d square by dx square, d square by dy square, d square by dz square. I sometimes work in spherical coordinate. This is the expression in spherical. This is the expression in cylindrical. As I promised you, I am not going to waste time on this. But let us look at some important points. Remember, I derived this equation, right? I mean, we have already proved that del square of phi is minus rho by epsilon 0. This is simply repeating this. All right. Now, I come to a very interesting thing. I am going to give you a few interesting points regarding Laplace's equation. Now, the statement I am going to make is the following. Now, here I have a region of space, some closed region of space S represented by a volume V. Inside this, I have three, I mean I have given three, you can take any number of uh, surfaces uh, enclosing volume. I have called them S1, S2, S3 and any number S1, S2, S3, S4 and the final surface, the bigger surface which encloses all of them is S. Now, I am saying now that I am interested in finding out what is the solution of the Laplace's equation inside. Now, we are saying that look that the uh, suppose I will I will prove the following that I have the following uh, conditions given. One is that the potential either the potential is equal to 0 on the surface or the derivative of the potential is given to be 0 on the surface. So, this is a boundary condition. Remember, whenever you solve differential equation, you need boundary conditions or initial conditions. Now, the conditions I have given you is either this, that is you have given me the values of phi or the values of the first derivative. Now, I am saying that the given uh, these conditions, uh, I will show that the solution is unique. In other words, now this is a very important point usually glossed over. Uh, the point that I am trying to make is this, that if you have a Laplace's equation corresponding to a given boundary condition, the first boundary condition type of boundary condition is called Dirichlet boundary condition, which simply says that you are you have given me the uh, values of the potential on the conducting surfaces let us say. And the other option is what is known as a Neumann boundary condition, which has not given me the values of phi, but it has given me the normal derivatives of phi. Now, my statement is that the uh, solution is unique. Now, let us see what it means. So, remember this is my divergence theorem del dot of a d tau is a dot n d s. Now, so what I am now going to do is this. So, I will uh, uh, first in this expression, I am going to be using what is known as the Green's first identity. Well, uh, this is something which we have done. Del dot of a, whatever is a uh, volume integral is that is divergence, the volume integral of a divergence is surface integral. I am saying that choose a particular uh, uh, a. Supposing a is phi delta psi, substitute here. So, what is del dot? The del dot this is a chain rule differentiation. So, I get del phi dot del psi and phi times del square psi. This is what I have written down there. So, that is my divergence d q bar that is equal to integral a dot n d s. Now, a is given to be this. So, therefore, phi times d psi by d n d s. Now, I am now claiming that let me take psi is equal to phi, okay, equal to some capital phi. If you do that, this becomes phi del square phi plus del phi dot del phi equal to this integral phi d phi by d n. Now, remember I have told you that I have given you on the surface, on the surface either the value of phi or the value of d phi by d n. Okay? So, therefore, this integral which is over a contour is equal to 0. So, this tells me that the left hand side is 0, whichever is the boundary condition this is 0. 
So, left hand side is 0 which means phi del square phi plus this is equal to 0 and this tells me that the notice this is equal to del phi absolute square this is the term okay? because del square phi is equal to 0 by Laplace's equation this is equal to 0 which tells me that del phi is equal to 0 which tells me since capital phi is phi 1 minus phi 2. So, it tells me that the solution is unique. Now, what is the importance of this? I have actually glossed over this derivation because I did not uh, want to waste a lot of time. Now, um, but uh, the, the details of the solution would be there on this. What have I actually said? I have said the following. I have said that given a boundary condition, given a boundary condition either by specifying the potential or by specifying the electric field on the boundaries, the solution of the Laplace's equation is unique. The, there cannot be two solutions. Now, let us take couple of examples, then I will tell you what is the importance of a uniqueness theorem. Because uniqueness theorem tells me that a Laplace's equation cannot have different solutions. But first, let us look at these two parallel plate capacitors. Uh, the lower one is grounded, it has a negative charge, the upper one is at some distance d. Now, I am asking what is the field in this region? Now, you all have done this calculation uh, in your schools, but let us look at how does uh, Laplace's equation give me. So, notice in this region there are no sources. So, my Laplace's equation is valid. Now, I take this cap capacitor plates to be infinite. So, therefore, the only variation of phi can be there in the z direction. So, del square phi is nothing but d square phi by dz square which is equal to 0. Now, this is a trivial second order differential equation whose solution is a z plus b. a is a constant, b is a constant. This is grounded. So, z equal to 0 the potential is equal to 0. Put it put this condition you get b is equal to 0. At z is equal to d, the potential is given to be phi 0. So, a becomes phi 0 by d. So, put it back, you get the potential to be phi 0 by dz. The electric field we have already said is minus d phi by dz, which is equal to minus phi 0 by dk. Now, notice this electric field is as we expect constant in this region. This is the parallel plate capacitor. So, therefore, the what is the charge density that I have? So, the charge density which we have just now said is epsilon 0 times the normal component of the electric field and normal component of the electric field is already this thing here. So, this is simply given by minus epsilon 0 because the direction of the uh, normal is this way here that way there. So, minus epsilon 0 phi 0 by t on the lower plate plus epsilon 0 phi 0 by d on the upper plate. But what, what is what general statements I can make, make about the Laplace's equation? Now, you will see I am trying to make a statement that Laplace's equation does not have any feature. It is not an interesting equation. Now, you will say what is this? If it is not an interesting equation, why are you spending so much of time? There is a reason for it. So, first let us look at the one dimensional equation. Remember what is one dimensional equation? d square phi by dx square is equal to 0. So, solution is mx plus c. Now, this is nothing. Suppose I have a boundary condition which says uh, that it is equal to 0 at x equal to 1 and it is equal to 3 at x equal to 2. I can write down phi of x equal to 3 x minus 3. What does it mean? It tells me that the phi x because it is a linear graph at any point is given by the average of the values at the two points where you have been given this. Again no great feature. Let us come to two dimension. Now, two dimensional Poisson's equation has interesting feature. This is actually a function which I have taken to be say suppose I am trying to uh, solve uh, dou square phi by dou x square plus dou square phi by dou y square equal to a. Now, the uh, a typical function which satisfies this equation is a by 4 x square plus y square. You can see that this equation is satisfied. 
this is the mathematical plot uh, or GNU plot of the function phi, which is a by 4 x square plus y square and the height is z of course. Now, if you plot it, you find that this picture, okay, it looks like a cup and it looks like a cup with a minimum at the bottom. So, it has a minimum at x equal to y equal to 0, the function rises in all other direction. So, this is an interesting equation that something has a minimum. Now, let us look at the corresponding situation in the two dimension of a Laplace's equation. Now, I want to in this case solve del dou square phi by dou x square plus dou square phi by dou y square equal to 0, not a. A typical example is for instance a by 4 x square minus y square. Now, this function is very interesting. If you plot this, you find it, its picture is a saddle. Saddle, if you remember, is the thing that you put on a horse's back. Now, what happens there is in one direction it rises, in the length direction it rises because the man is the, the um, jockey is going to sit down on it. On the other direction, it has to fall down along the back of the horse. So, therefore, the this is what is called a saddle and it rises like this, but at that point in the another direction it falls. This is the feature that is common in all dimensions. In other words, even this does not have a minimum. This a saddle point, it is there uh, only in a particular direction, it is a maximum in one direction, minimum in another direction. So, once again without much of a feature. Now, the fact that the uh, potential cannot have a minimum or a maximum if it is satisfying Laplace's equation. This I came, I gave you from uh, general plotting and giving you some examples. Uh, these can be rigorously proved, but I am not going to even attempt it. The, there is an interesting theorem which goes by the name of Armser's theorem. It says that a system of charge cannot be held in static equilibrium by electrostatic forces alone. Now, this is very interesting theorem. It says you cannot put a system of charges in equilibrium purely by static equilibrium, purely by electrostatic force. Now, and the reason is obvious that since in that region there are no other charges, the charge must be the, the, the point where the charge is there should be satisfying the Laplace's equation. Now, if it satisfies the Laplace's equation, the potential cannot have any minimum. Now, if the potential cannot have any minimum, I cannot have a stable equilibrium. Okay? So, potential energy also has no minimum. The, uh, what I will do is this that I want to, there are many interesting points about solving Laplace's equation in spherical coordinates. If time permits, we will do that in our um, uh, tutorial session. Uh, but uh, let me go over uh, before that for the remaining time that I have for uh, to discuss another method, which is known as the method of images, which you might find interesting. Okay. So, uh, what I want to do now is the following. I will uh, uh, tell you uh, something about a method of images. Now, why do I want to talk about images? Let me uh, consider an infinite grounded conducting plane. Remember grounding means the potential is 0. Now, in front of that, I have a charge Q which is located. The question is, what is the potential at any arbitrary point P? due to this combination of charge q and the infinite grounded sheet that we have. Now, you will say that what is this problem? See the point is this that the potential of this uh, thing has to be kept because it is grounded it has to be kept at 0. But on the other hand because of this charge the there would be certain amount of electric field here and I want to keep the uh, potential at 
uh, zero potential. I mean, uh, the this surface at zero potential. So therefore, the presence of this charge, this you have learned from school, that the presence of this charge on this metal surface will induce charges. The question is, what is the charges that is induced? Okay, how do I solve this problem? Normally, if you tried to solve this problem by application of Coulomb's law and things like that, it is almost a an impossible problem to work out. But I have just now told you something very interesting. We have said there is something called a uniqueness theorem, and the uniqueness theorem told us that if there is a region of space, for example, this point P is a point where there are no charges in this region, I can. Now, then at the point P, a Laplace's equation must be satisfied. So, Laplace's equation simply says phi is equal to 0, I mean sorry, del square phi is equal to 0. So, how does one solve this problem? Now, remember what is the, what is the reason for uh, doing the method of the method of images told me that suppose you have been able to guess a solution. Now, if you have guessed a solution, uniqueness theorem tells you that is the only solution that is possible. Remember what I am doing. I am saying suppose by hook or by crook, you have managed to say okay, this solution is good enough. Okay. What should be the characteristic of that solution? Firstly, it must satisfy Laplace's equation. Secondly, it must keep the boundary condition given, namely that on the surface the potential is equal to 0. How do I manage it? In order to manage it, I do what is called a method of images. I will guess a solution and uniqueness theorem will tell me that if I have been able to guess a solution, the solution must be correct and must be the only solution. So, what I do is I go back to my knowledge of optics and I say that look, supposing I stand in front of a mirror, then I find an image of mine on a mirror at a distance which is equal to the object distance, plane mirror. So, I, uh, if I am in front of uh, a mirror at a distance d, the uh, image which is virtual uh, is, it is virtual because you cannot get it on a screen at a distance uh, d behind the mirror. Now, what I have done here is something, this idea is what I have done. I said all right, you have a distance d from the top, imagine that beneath, now remember this is virtual, so I am not really interested in doing anything and it is a infinite sheet. So, there is nothing like a below, just as there is nothing like the other side of a mirror. Uh, so, these are virtual world. So, I imagine there is a charge q prime located at a distance d prime. What is q prime? What is d prime? I do not know. But the condition is that the potential at p, my original problem, that is this charge plus this conductor is equivalent to this charge and a charge q prime at a distance d prime in below the conductor uh, in such a way that the potential at p satisfies Laplace's equation and the uh, boundary condition uh, on the uh, surface. If I can do that, then the solution that I get must be the only solution and that is the powerful technique. Now, so let us look at it. I have said forget about this uh, surface, imagine you have a charge q and you have a charge q prime at a distance, this is I take this as the origin, I take the plane, the infinite plane as the x y plane and this as the z axis, this as the minus z axis. So, I said this distance is r 1 this distance is r 2. Original problem of charge plus the surface has been replaced by a charge plus another virtual charge. 
and due to these two if I can satisfy my uh, condition that is Laplace's equation is satisfied and the boundary condition is valid then I will get a solution. So, look, look from Q now notice I am only interested in obtaining the solution above the surface because below the surface does not mean anything. So, do not put the uh, negative values on your solution. So, potential due to Q is Q by 4 pi epsilon 0 r 1. Now, notice I can since my uh, surface is the x y plane I can take go over to so my what is my distance r 1 my distance r 1 is uh, so I am calculating the distance of this point. Now, this point is at this is at d. So, therefore, if the coordinate of this is x y z this coordinate of this point is 0 0 d. So, the distance is x square plus y square plus z minus d whole square. So, the potential due to this charge q is q by 4 pi epsilon 0 square root x square plus y square plus z minus d whole square. Potential due to this virtual charge is phi 2 which is q prime by 4 pi epsilon 0 r 2 and that is given by q prime by square root of x square plus y square plus z plus d prime whole square because this is extra distance here. So, the my total potential is simply the sum of these two. Now, what do I want now? I still do not know what is q what, sorry what is q prime what is d. So, what I say is that look firstly my net potential is this plus this, but I know phi 1 satisfies Laplace's equation phi 2 satisfies Laplace's equation. So, phi 1 plus phi 2 of course, satisfies Laplace's equation. Now, then I do the following. I say all right, I want the potential to be 0 at the ground. So, I want this term okay, the, if I come to x y z equal to some x y the any point here which is uh, the x y 0 take z is equal to 0. Now, then the net potential calculated by this formula should give me 0 which means that by putting uh, that I get q square plus x square plus y square plus d prime square because I put there z is equal to 0 equal to q prime square plus x square plus y square plus d square. You uh, rewrite it and you find that the solution is q prime equal to minus q, q and d prime equal to d. Now, if you take q prime equal to minus q that is meant by what is meant by that is I have a negative charge equal to in magnitude to this positive charge situated at a distance d prime equal to d below the curve. If I do that then my Laplace's equation is of course, satisfied, but my potential on the surface also turns out to be 0. So, I have now because of the uniqueness theorem been able to obtain an expression for the potential for this problem. Now, once I get an expression for the potential this is mathematics. So, I am not doing it here, but it might be there on your. So, this plus this is my expression replace q prime by minus q and d, d prime by d and you get this plus this there is a minus sign here there is a plus sign there this plus this is the expression for the potential. Now, once you have got the potential you can calculate the electric field and you can calculate how much is the normal component of the electric field. Okay? Now, you notice something very interesting that if you now take the normal component of the electric field to calculate how much is the charge density that is induced on that surface. Now, realize that the charge density is, is negative because the of uh, the fact that uh, you know there is a positive charge there the charge density is negative. Now, this is a plot of what the charge density is like I mean I have not given you the expression because we are really running short of time on electrostatics. What you find is 
the charge density on the plane is maximum or because it is a negative thing, it does not matter, that is why a dip is being shown at a point at points directly opposite the real charge and decreases as the distance on uh, I mean on the surface from the direct point of the real charge increases. So, this is uh, the way the field lines will be looking like. See, I have just about 5 minutes, uh, the, I need to still talk about uh, uh, you know dielectrics which I will try to do it tomorrow, uh, method of images, other examples will be there in tutorial. If there are quick questions, clarifications related to what we talk about in this session, I will make it now. Otherwise, please send your um, questions which we will uh, talk about. Which is this college? Don Bosco. Yes, Don Bosco, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So, can you please go to page number 24? The, the, the question, the clarification that I would like is, yes. in this case, uh, yeah. you have applied the Gauss theorem, the Gauss law, yeah. in this particular problem. Yeah. So, in the, as per the, on the left hand side, yeah. there is an integral of e dot ds. Yes. And uh, over here, yeah. uh, left hand side, the closed integral of e dot ds is there. Right. So, we have one surface above and one yeah. surface below because right. only these two surfaces right. contribute to the total flux. Right. Now, my question is, yeah. uh, e above, it is yeah. pointing upwards and ds on the up, uh, upper surface is also pointing upwards. No, no, you remember when Lower I surface e Yeah, I know that, but I have pointed out that there is a printing error there, twice above is written. Okay. Well, while I was talking, you are right, but I am saying that I had pointed it out that there is an error in that slide. Okay? Okay. All right. Sorry about okay. it. But uh, obviously, it does, that equation does not make sense. It is 0 on the left hand side. I, mean, I, 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 had, I had realized it, but I also made a statement to that effect when I was talking about it. Yes, go ahead. Next. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is. Uh, Petroleum technology is that? Uh, uh, sir, this is regarding a problem uh, by applying Gauss law. Yeah. If I want to calculate electric field at a point yeah. inside a charged non-conducting sphere without using Gauss law, can I do that? Uh, what do you want? Uh, you want to calculate electric I field inside? I want to calculate the electric field. No, no, just. Inside a uniformly charged non-conducting sphere. Yes. Without using Gauss law. Of course you can because do it. If I apply Gauss law, yeah. then for a point inside this charge sphere, yeah. which we generally take on a Gaussian surface, yeah. and the charge enclosed by Gaussian surface will only contribute to the electric field at that point. Right. Right. But why the charge which is not enclosed by the Gaussian surface right. does not contribute to electric field? But this is, this is precisely what I tried to explain in the morning when I was talking about that the charges which are outside, if you take a Gaussian surface. A, a typical charge which I, uh, when I was talking to you about the uh, solid angle problem, I said that the flux lines, if you are uh, putting lines from the a outside point to the Gaussian surface, it cuts it in two places. It cuts it in two places because it is an external point. Now, if it cuts it in two places, then irrespective of what is the surface, the uh, amount of the solid angle is the same and one of them is negative, the other one is positive. So, therefore, it cancels out. It is because of that, if you remember right in the morning I talked about that, that uh, in fact that question came up yesterday that if there is a charge outside, take any surface and you try to, any closed surface, you try to draw uh, lines from there which goes in at one place, comes out at the other place. So, there is a flux which is going out, there is a one direction of the normal uh, direction and when it is entering it is another direction. Flux is entering, flux is going out. So, therefore, there is no contribution to the surface integral for charges which are outside. Okay? The best way to look at is through that. Uh, sir, and doing it uh, by Coulomb actually, law is, is e possible, but is difficult. But. Uh, uh, Am I supposed to get a different result uh, if I do not use Gauss law? No, 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 no. If you, you do not have to. See, Gauss's law makes this type of problem with symmetry very easy. But Coulomb's law is always valid, so is Gauss's law. But if there is no symmetry, you will not be able to use it properly. Now, but however, if you want to use Coulomb's law now, what you have to do is take all charge distribution. 
including the charges which are outside. Okay? Then find out what is the strength of the electric field, then add it up. Okay? In this particular case, because of the spherical symmetry, doing those integrations will not be too difficult. But in general, if the symmetry is not there, using a Coulomb's law poses a very big challenge. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, we will break now for tea and uh, you please assemble for the next lecture and uh, please send your questions on chat. I will as uh, today, uh, this morning I did, I will take up all your questions um, uh, as long as it is relevant to whatever I am teaching tomorrow morning the first thing. Thank you.